What is happening, y'all? Cowboy here, and welcome to my advanced guide for Wild Hearts. Now, of course, we have a starter guide on the channel, and I'm going to have that linked in both the comments and the description down below. But there's quite a few things I've learned along my journey, and that is the purpose of this guide. We're going to be talking about all of the more advanced things that you want to know as you work your way towards late game, towards Volatile Kimono or Mighty Kimono or wherever you're at in your journey. So, just to give you a... Quick heads up, obviously you're going to see monster names and icons, spoiler type stuff. This is a late game guide. I'm not going to be like, this is the final boss, but, you know, just putting it out there. You will see some stuff. Um, in this video, we're going to be covering non-kimono mat farming, a, a detailed overview of cooking. We're going to be talking about layout and camp placement, uh, choosing your basic karakuri based on weapons and fusions, talisman hunting, uh, some advanced weapon creation, and then lastly, we will touch on transmog. So to start, let's jump right on into material farming. And there's a couple things right here in town that we have set up. Uh, now, these are the animal pens and the animal cages. Uh, these are actually important to get a couple different mats. In the pens, you can put some of the bigger animals, things like the snakes, the fox, the cranes. And you can see I'm getting feathers from them. I can just sell that. So they are an easy source of money. Uh, over here in the cage, I just put a dragonfly. So I'm getting a fall wasabi from it. That's a seasoning. But there's a couple different things. You know, if I need animal seeds, I can put the squirrels in there. Uh, if I need feathers, I can put the swallows in there. That's whatever the case is going to be. But make sure you're using these animals to get some of those more rare materials. Because there's some cases, like the pet kimono seeds, you can only get that from using stuff like the squirrels in the cages, which is very important. Now, besides that, there are other materials we can get. Going on over here to this shrine, you can see I picked up some core stone. And in particular, we're going to talk about a couple different ones that we can have. We have the Sukumo Ore Shrine. We have the Sukumo Food Shrine. And then this one is, is more for hunts, but we also have the Celestial Sukumo Camp. And let's talk about all of those and how those pertain to farming next. Uh, so we're just going to hop on... I I think this one should be off cooldown. Let me go to Ime Sama's hideout. Uh, now, I have these set up on all four of my maps, the ore shrines. Now, the ore shrines are very important because it's going to take all the, the typical you running around and farming in a area. You're not going to have to do that. So here we are at the camp, and you can see I have a bunch of these shrines set up. And it's going to take me like half a second. I'm just going to walk through, hit the left trigger, collect all the ore. And you can see I'm getting some demon rock, which is uh, the unique material in the higher level portion of this region. And so what's useful about these shrines is not only are you loading up on things like ore and core stone, but you're also pulling in the region specific materials. If you're in the, uh, well, I'll show you later, but if we're in the island region, we're getting stuff like the, the coral and the blue columnar ore. If we're over here, we're getting demon rock. So set these on up and make sure that you are collecting these materials on a regular basis. This is just stuff that you can find over in the Karakuri tree. Uh, the other one, the thread, I like having one or two of these per map. This just gives you a hunter's arm effect. It also activates the strong arm effect. So if you have a build based around strong arm bonuses, you can have these at different camps in the map and basically grab them before you go out, out onto a hunt to start with that bonus, as well as of course, starting with more kimono thread at your disposal, just ready to go. Uh, there is one last one that we're going to talk about, and that is over here at Harugasami Way. Hop on over to the giant tree trunk camp, and we'll talk about food farming as well as show off some cooking stuff. So now that we are over here, uh, the last cooking thing I want to talk about is ingredient collection. You can have these on maps, and these will also pull from things that are common on that map. So in this case, uh, sesame seeds, prickly ash peppers, shiitake mushrooms. I'm constantly going to get those from these areas. So... Another thing just to keep in mind, you know, you should be having these collect shrines on, on all of your maps because it's a very easy way to just load up on materials, you know, walking over here, same as, same as before, just going to run through, I'm getting all the Sakura stone, the Sakura stone is obviously unique to this region because of the Sakura trees, um, and you're going to burn through mats fairly fast late game, like, each weapon basically is going to cost 10 core stones, so having 300 or so core stone is incredibly helpful. Moving on from there though, let's talk about cooking. Now, we have four basic uh, four basic setups involved in cooking. We have drying, fermenting, pickling, and smoking. Uh, smoking is considered a finishing process. Pickling is for creating unique effects. Fermenting is for creating the seasonings to use in pickling. And then lastly, we have drying. So just to go through each and their purpose. So looking at dry, here's a great example. I have red meat. I have dried sliced meat here. 
Uh, you can see this is going to have a 13 health boost, or excuse me, this is going to have 7 health boost and 3% attack boost base. If I dry it and I create dry red meat, those bonuses are going to increase. It's going to go up to 13 health and 6% attack. Uh, kind of kind of similar to this one. This was just just a uh, different meat from the red meat. But you know the basic idea here is that it's going to uh, it's going to cost more fullness. You can see it goes from 40 fullness to 60, but it's going to increase the effects that the meat has. So think of this as just a way to boost what is already on there. Uh, you know, same thing, drying, drying something like a vegetable. You know, two health boost, three freezing. It's going to go up to four health boost, six freezing. So drying your, your base ingredients, your veggies, your meats, your grains, your fish, it's just going to increase the raw effect on them. And then we have pickling. Now, pickling is a way to impart those ingredients with bonus effects. And the thing with pickling is pickling doesn't care if meat has been dried or not. So if you're going to pickle, you don't want to dry. For example, if I'm using the cubed meat here and I'm using prickly ash pepper, you can see I'm going to get 11 health, 12 fire, and 1 attack. Same thing if I use the dried slice meat, 11 health, 12 fire, 1 attack. So think of pickling as a way to just change up your meat in advance. If you have a, a bunch of meat, um, you know, and I want that meat to all have health, fire, and attack, or maybe health, attack, and fire resilience, or uh, what's what's the one we just got? We just picked up a uh, fall wasabi. That's going to give me health, fire boost, and attack boost. Uh, but as you can see, going with different seasonings, whether it's wasabi or monkey liquor or rock salt or whatever the case is, that's going to change the effects that are on the meat, the, the raw bonus that that meat is going to have. In this case, it's salted meat, spicy meat, uh, you know, pickled meat, uh, you can also make herbed meat. But so think of pickling as a way to take your base ingredient and add an additional effect onto that, whether it's going to be like a fire resist or, or a, uh, you know, additional crit. So attacking crit, something like that. Now to pickle, we are going to ferment ingredients. Now you can ferment anything except for seasonings because they've already been fermented. Uh, but so millets will turn into miso paste, meat will turn into meat paste, fish will turn into fish paste, vegetables will turn into vinegar. And this is how you make the various seasonings that you're going to use in the pickling process. So if you're going to be doing pickling, you're going to want to have a cask. If you want to keep things basic, you just work with the drying rack. Lastly, we have the smoker. And the smoker is a way to just get better stuff. So here is some herb meat that's going to be health blaze attack. You can see if I smoke it, it becomes smoked herb meat. It goes from 12 to 13 on health, 8 to 10 on blaze, and 2 to 3 on attack. Uh, there is no downside to smoking as far as I can tell. It is strictly always just going to upgrade the potency of your meat. So this is, think of smoking as like a finishing step. Uh, now the last thing I want to talk about is uh, the vermilions. Now, for example, I have a vermilion fermenting cask and a regular. I have pickle jar and vermilion pickle jar. As far as I can tell, this just changes what dragon pits are needed to make these items. Uh, looking at the, the jar here, you can see uh, I would need four millets. And using chili pepper, I'm going to get 2012-12 on health, earth, and wind boost. If I go over to the regular pickle jar, same exact thing. It's going to cost four millets, and you can see I'm also going to get 2012-12. So it's just a way to, to make things a little bit easier to create, depending on what resources you have left on your map to use. You know, if you have lots of fire, you can go for the regular one, whereas if you have lots of water, go for the vermilion. Um, now, besides this stuff, there are some ingredients you'll occasionally find in the store, so don't forget to, to check the commissary store uh, back over in Minato. And then, obviously, there's some stuff that, as you saw a moment ago, you're going to be able to get from pets. So, you know, there are lots of different ingredients, uh, but those are the basics of the cooking. Personally, I end up doing the drying rack a lot just because it's more basic. And, and one thing to keep in mind as well, you know, stuff like this is going to be health, blaze, and attack boost. You know, sometimes just straight attack and, and just like, you know, 6% attack and 11% health is going to be nice. And keep in mind, smoking is going to always finish. So if I go here, I'm just going to boost that up to 14 health, 6% attack, smoke dried sliced meat, super straightforward, no, no fancy bonuses, just health and attack. So sometimes, you know, keeping it basic is going to be better. So don't, don't feel like, oh, I'm at the end game. I don't need the drying rack. Like, well, you might, you might want the drying rack. Moving on from there though, let's talk about smart map layouts because this is something i don't see a lot of especially in online play i've been doing a ton of online play uh and i zone in and people got like a camp they got one tower and they have one tower here and it's like what are you, what is this what are you doing this is terrible so let's talk about 
Actually, no, we're gonna, we're gonna warp to a different, a different, uh, we're gonna go to a whole different map to talk about smart map layouts. We're gonna go over to our Nakusadachi Isle, and I'm gonna go to my Coral Salt Swap Camp. Now, this is one of my favorite camps because it gives me access to a ton of stuff in the region. I think the first time you come over to this particular camp, uh, or, or this zone, actually, you know, when you, when you, when you spawn on in, you're over here, you can go left, you can go right. There's a huge cliff face, so it's not very accessible to kind of get up into the hunts. And that is the purpose of this camp. Where are we, you may ask? Literally on top of the giant coral structure in the middle of the map. Uh, this is kind of a testament to just how ridiculous you can get with camp placements. Because this doesn't look like it would be a typical camping spot. But guess what? Monsters that are right down there. If I want to get down to that grit dog, it's right there, baby. I can just jump on down. I can ride the wheel on down. Uh, I could do the stake to mitigate damage or the glider. Either way is going to work. If I want to go over that way, I can shoot. Uh, if I need to, to get on over to the stones, that way I can go. And more important than that, I want to talk about the tower. You'll notice that I have a tower right next to this camp. My other towers, if we, we look at the map, you can see this one's kind of off on its own a little bit. Don't really have access to it. Same with this one. This one's way up here. But what's great is with this layout, you can see I have 100% map coverage. And so the important thing I really want to stress here is whatever your main hunting camp is, in this case for me, it's Coral Salt Swamp. Yeah, Coral Salt Swamp. This is where I'm going to start my hunts from anytime I'm coming to this zone. So I'm going to have one tower here for ease of access, and then the other towers can be set up anywhere on the map. And that is going to give me that spread. I can see where every little hidden Sukumo or relic is on the map with all these question marks. I can always see exactly where all of the kimono are going to be. I can see my whole network. So keep that in mind because I see a lot of people, they're not utilizing their range. They'll have like one tower here and then they'll have one right here. And then the whole upper half of the map is just empty. And so I'm zoning in to try and help them. And I'm like, man, I... I have no idea where the monster is. We have no fast travel camps. Like, this is this is pretty bad. This is a pretty bad layout. Um, but talking about layouts, so this map in particular, like, I'd actually prefer to have one more camp up here, but I, uh, I don't currently have the, the resources. Obviously, soon I'll be there. I'm only 13 off. Um, but let's talk about camp placement. So, in this case, Seashore Camp was a freebie. Sullivan Settlement Ruins is a freebie. Uh, the reason I went for the Coral Salt Swamp Camp is because getting over this ledge is usually a pain. And you might say, well, do you really need that if you have these Sullivan Settlement Ruins? And the thing is, this is still very accessible. We have a lot of fights that happen right down here. Like I said, Grit Dog's right there. So we're already right there above it. Uh, from this camp, there's, if I need to get over here to, to where the, uh, you know, stuff likes to fight over there on that plane a lot, so it's very easy to make my way on over there. You know, probably the only area I don't have easy access to would be where the lava back likes to hang out. And we can actually get to that from the Sylvan Settlement Ruins pretty easily with a flying wire. And this is the thing, like, you know, I have, I have these camps set up in a way so that any camp I'm on, I'm going to be able to, you know, do that. And then I have a Celestial Thread right here. I'll jump on that and then boom, boom, boom. And now we're at our lava bag. Took me like 10 seconds to get over here. And so that's what I'm, when I'm talking about having smart camp placements. This is what I mean. Have your camps and have your vines set up in a way that you can easily navigate maps. And not only that, but think about where you're placing them. Because up here, for example, there are a lot of the flying hunts are going to end up here. So when you're when you're fighting the the Raven, for example, he likes to come up here a lot. And this is a pretty hard area to get up to, you know, just to get up here. There's like a long winding path or alternatively, there's a cave system and you can jump on up kind of right under that rock. Uh, but it, it's a bit of a pain in the ass. And so I have a camp right here, very much a non-traditional location, but it's going to give me easy access to that. And then on top of that, it's going to serve twofold. If I want to get down and do a beach hunt. Look at that right there. There's a pearl beak and I'm already at the beach. So think about where you are placing your camps. Think about where you are, are putting your flying vines because it's going to make a, a very big difference in your overall hunting experience. Moving on from there, next up, we're gonna be talking about selecting your basic Karakuri based on both weapon importance and fusion importance. Now, personally, I more like to pick my basics based on what I need for my particular weapons. And a good example of this, I'm gonna just get a little bit away from stuff. Uh, but so with the Karakuri staff, I really like the box because I can do the plunge and the spin. Now on top of that, the torch is gonna give me a unique one. I'm gonna throw on out and go into a spin to slam. 
But then right now I have on the Celestial Thread and I have on the Glider. And these are going to have the same exact attack for me. So in this case, I actually prefer the Thread because I can do this and then do my Helicopter Spin to win. Um, and I can do that from the Glider as well. The Glider is going to also provide that attack. But the thing is with the Celestial Thread, I can do that three times in a row. Whereas the glider, I can do it multiple, but I gotta wait for the glider to land. So it's gonna slow things down a lot. Now, you'll notice I don't even have the springboards on uh, with the staff right now. And that's because, I mean, the springboard attack is is okay. Uh, we have like a dash in where we attack, and then uh, it's, it's... Let me see if I can actually just kind of show what it's gonna do. Uh, it's gonna dash, and then we're gonna go into like one of those, which is a little bit slow. It's actually the, the the thrust version of that flips it over your head, uh, and it's not bad. But I just think there are better attacks available. So because of that, I don't actually use a springboard with my Karakuri staff. Now, I don't use it with the Karakuri staff. However, if I was using something like the Nodachi, it's absolutely going to be needed because I'm going to need the stamina that I get from the spring to help with the Nodachi. Uh, in a similar case, if I was using the cannon, I'm going to want to have the glider because the glider gives me that aerial fire attack, and I don't get that from the celestial anchor. And those are going to be the things that determine most important to me what basic card curry I need. Now, obviously, you should keep in mind the, the fusion choices that you're going to get as well, uh, but more than the fusion choices, honestly, you should really focus on what... I'm getting out of these for my weapon and in this case every single one of these well uh, all of them three of them technically are giving me what I want and I'm keeping the stake for the fusion of the chain trap because chain trap is going to give me access uh, to a lockdown for when I deploy my my judgment bleed uh, so that's gonna be the most important thing now obviously another thing to keep in mind is that you're gonna have a pretty good fusion spread almost regardless of what you're using. In this case, I have Bulwark so I can stop chargers. I have Chain Trap so I can lock monsters down. Uh, I have Healing Vaporizer, which I actually prefer that to Healing Mist, and I have Firework to handle aerials. So aerial is taken care of, ground charges are taken care of, and overall we're, we're in a good position. But just for the sake of comparison, if I go over to Basic Car Curry, let's say I, I put the Spring back on and I put the Glider back on, just two alternatives. This is another very common setup that I like to use a lot. I now have repeater crossbow as opposed to firework. That's going to help to take stuff down. Uh, on top of chain trap, I now have harpoon so I can lock down flyers. And although I, I lost the, the heal, I do have healing mist now. And I have access to elemental lantern, which I think you could argue that those are gonna be better for prolonged encounters. I uh, still have bulwark still. You know, I've now gained access to shield wall. Uh, and so the point is, you know, you're gonna have access to fusions that are going to work almost regardless of your situation. Uh, I wouldn't ever be like, oh, well, you know, I have to have access to Celestial Cannon. If I don't have Celestial Cannon, I can't run my build. Like, yeah, Celestial Cannon and Shield are nice and all, but the most important thing here is going to be picking your basic Karakuri based on the needs of your weapons, not necessarily the needs of the fusions, because you're going to be able to get by almost every time with the fusions that you have accessible. Uh, now moving on from there, let's talk about talismans. I talked about talismans a little bit on the, the basic video. Uh, just to reiterate that, when it comes to, to getting talismans, one of the best ways is constantly getting hunter's arms off on monsters. Uh, I have a couple that are, I have one that I picked up that was really solid. This guy, Final Blow 4 and Destruction Art 6, really big fan of that. I mean, I guess this is the equivalent of like an attack necklace in Monster Hunter. So I'm like, yeah, you're locked. I'm never losing you. Um, but besides using your hunter arm, which I cannot stress enough, hunter arm, hunter arm, hunter arm, you can also find talismans hidden on the maps. Now, these will be revealed by your towers after you have done a little bit of looking. And we can see there's one right here. You can see I have this little question mark. And uh, you may have already found some of these in your journey, but definitely keep your eye out because there are some rather interesting talismans that you can find in the map if you take the time to look. So this particular one I've, I've been saving literally just for this video. So over here, we can see there is a little island. I went ahead and created a flying vine. I'm going to shoot on over. And here we have a sword, uh, very similar to like the relics and Monster Hunter. And now I got Tiny Charm, Great Sakura. So we can hop on back, see what we got. Uh, but, you know, just keep in mind, besides farming the monsters, you're also going to find talismans that are hidden throughout the map like that. And, uh, and this one, I mean, that's cool, Knocking Marvel. Yeah, that's 14% on Bull Boasting. Great. For bow people, that's great. 
Um, but some of them are really, really good. Like this one, Hunter's Talisman. I, I don't remember exactly where I got this. I want to say this was actually in the second zone, but I've used this since I got it because Tapping Expert allows me to, to one-tap trees. Now, obviously, at, at 21, it takes up some, uh, some pretty high capacity, but honestly, just being like, I need thread, and then one hit like that, that's useful to me. To me, that's going to be worth it. So, uh, big, big fan of that. Uh, but with all of that stuff covered, we're going to head on back to Minato. And to wrap the video up, I'm going to talk about advanced weapon building. And then lastly, we're going to touch on the transmog system for the game. Actually, one, one last thing before we jump into that. Um, I've seen a couple people talking about uh, how, how building the, the Karakuri is a little bit goofy at times. And they, they struggle to to get stuff up like they'll you know if they're trying to do it and they're pressing the buttons it won't make the, the firework whatever the case is the fusion is fast you know looking at this clip right here here's a great example of of this happening in practice and what i really want to stress to people is just keep in mind in online play there's going to be a little bit of latency if you slow down slightly like for my chain trap if i just xxa xxa you know just a little bit slower than i typically would i maybe delayed each input a half a second and that's going to go through online perfectly fine without issues um, just keep in mind you, you can't be like XXA, XXA. You, you can't go super speed when you're playing in an online lobby the game's just i mean I don't know, maybe the netcode will improve in the future but for now just you know, slow down half a second i promise you'll be fun um, but so anyway moving on let's talk about how to build an end game weapon so i've just now finished my my first end game weapon my karakuri staff uh, so this is an idea of how you would get an end game weapon all the way built out and so i want to talk about what we did here now keep in mind when you get to the final product there are a set number of inheritables that you're going to be able to have in this case four now this weapon is going to have fog fall no matter what because that is the inheritable already on void karakuri so i had to get over here with only four inheritables so what we did looking at the top we're not worried about any skills up here so we're just going to go straight on down we're gonna get straight to like basically the the mighty tree the high rank tree uh, and then from there probably the best thing to do is think of it like going through a labyrinth backwards so in this case i looked through all of my skills and there were a couple things i knew i wanted i wanted to end on this because it had mountain felling giant blade uh, over here there's an inherited mountain felling giant blade that i wanted and over here there's an inherited mountain felling giant blade i wanted so because of that i figured all right well what are the other two inheritables that i'm going to want to do and i looked around Destruction art 15%. I was like, you know what? That's actually, that, that's a pretty solid skill. 15% easier destruction. Okay, I could get down with that. And then I figured what will combo with that well. I said, oh, one stroke boosts attack. So I destroy a part and then I'm going to get uh, an 18% damage increase. Yeah, that sounds good. So then from there, we're going to work backwards. So we're going to start. This is our final product. We have to get to here to get over to here because we need that inheritable. We need that inheritable. Then we're going to go here. We're going to start going up. Need to go past this, so you can't go this way. I need to go here and get Destruction Art. Uh, from Destruction Art, the fastest would be to go over, shoot over, and then go back down to pick up my my uh, One Stroke Fury. And then from there, I'm going to go on out. And so it's, it's really good to kind of plot your way out in advance. You can actually watch us do this in real time on the stream. Um, and then obviously keep in mind, it's going to take a lot of mats. Uh, but this this is essentially this is what a, a end game weapon that is is optimized is going to look like our final product here has the inherited or inherent mountain felling giant blade 40 percent we've picked up two more so we're boosting that up to 70 percent and then i've decided to opt in for destruction art and one stroke fury uh, and build around that for maximum damage so just keep in mind kind of what you want your your final product to be uh, in general you're going to have pretty comparable damage for the gold tier trees. So 780 damage here, uh, some elemental choices obviously uh, going down here. That one's gonna be 760 or 780, 760. Uh, over here, you know, this is gonna be 660, but we have we have uh, some more utility type stuff on it. Uh, big bonus with earth down here, we have another 780. This, you know, over here, another 780. So keep in mind, pretty much pick any of the, the gold tiers to end on and then just figure out how you want to work around and work over to that to reach your final product. And I'm moving on from there. Let's talk yeah, about please. transmog because this is honestly, it's one of the, the few things in the game that I genuinely do not like. Um, and so I'm hoping we see this addressed, but this is unlocked in the post game and it's known as cladding. Now the way that you have to have cladding made is you have to already have the piece of armor 
and then you have to have the magical orb from hunting in that region, hunting the uh, the volatile monsters in that region, and then you have to pay a ton of gold on top of it. So in this case, I would have had to have crafted the hunter's Hachigani, done some Harugasumi hunts to get a magical Harugasumi orb, and then pay 5,000 gold on top of it. So as of now, the only thing I've done is craft this, this headpiece, uh, just because I didn't like the, the headpiece that I was on, just to show what I was rocking. So I like this one, but the kimono path puts this like weird mask on it, and I was like, can't have that. Um, but honestly, the, the best use case for this, in my opinion, is just going to be old armors that you used while leveling up that you want to go back to. Uh, you know, For example, I, I really like the, the red cloth on the Argent Breastplate. I think that looks pretty good, whereas uh, with the, the end game set, it turns into blue. I like blue. I just think the red looks better with it. So that would be a, a good use case for this system because I already have access to that. I already have Argent Breastplate Kimono Path done. But even then, I'm going to need to get two separate orbs from the Fuyu Fusagi area. I'm going to need to hunt the Deathstalker into the ground to get six orbs, pay 5,000 gold on top of it, and already have that Argent Breastplate crafted. So if you're looking to craft endgame gear, like for example, if you just wanted to, to fashion yourself with the Garuda set, you're gonna have to, to farm up the Garuda chess piece, the Garuda Uwagi, then you're gonna have to make the Kimono Path version of it, then you're gonna need 7,000 gold on top of five Natsu Sukudachi orbs and 10 Ember Plume orbs. And that is a huge oh, ask for Transmog. So. Is Transmog in the game? Yes, it's in the game, but man, it is expensive and it is a tedious ass grind to get it done. So, you know, Koei Tecmo EA, if y'all are watching, please, for the love of God, Transmog should not be, <laughs> it shouldn't be that big of an ask just to change the fashion of what your character looks like. Uh, but either way, that is going to wrap things up for the advanced guide. So moving on forward from here, uh, I'm going to be start doing weapon guides. Obviously, the Karukuri staff is done. It looks fantastic. Uh, still doing a little bit of farming. I want to get my armor all fleshed out before I jump into that video for y'all. Uh, but we will have weapon guides coming up. So thanks for tuning on in, and I will catch y'all next time with more Wild Hearts.